And I guess uh, the mu the opening music is playing. I suppose I'm not hearing it. All right, uh, all right there. No key for today. Uh, he's going into a banquet tonight, oh. so no. Oh. So it'll be just us, I guess. He'll probably join in later on, like he always does there. Yeah, we're not. I don't know. He's some banquet, some weird. All right. All right, there. Probably a soccer banquet. <laughs> This could That's, go two parts because I've got at least forty guys. I gotta, I gotta go long list myself. But as I mentioned, you know, uh, stuff that already already know, stuff people who knew deserve to be known, and the people who should have been known a long time ago but sadly didn't for some reason. There, I got a few out here that deserve the recognition. There. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So um, everything's good here. Mm -hmm. Well, pretty much everybody in my list deserves a nod absolutely there that's true there i tried not to name any crappy ones all right there i try to give the ones that i mean, definitely... like, i don't really i don't really have a list because there's only so many keyboardists but i'll give my opinions and i do want to watch raw tonight because listen guys all right there. <laughs> wrestlemania was so good this past weekend it really was i mean i laughed it was entertaining ah Vince McMahon um, wrestled. Steve Austin was like wrestled a full match. Like, oh wow, was, interesting. Uh, this was after Kevin Owens. Uh, Vince McMahon wrestled last night, and then oh. Kevin Owens wrestled uh, Steve oh. Austin in the Olds Bar match. Oh yeah, and then that was the night before, and well, that was one of yes. the headliners there. So was, Aust so Austin prevailed over McMahon. I take it right again. Yes, and it was ah. a huge, huge. WrestleMania. I mean, it was very entertaining. Oh yeah, because you know this is his home state here. Right. All right, there. And this was in Dallas, if I'm correct. Yes. Ah, good, yes. good. Ah, sweet. They didn't do it in the stadium in Arlington. No, they did. They did. I see there. Yeah. Okay, that's right. not Dallas. Oh, you know what I mean, like. Uh, it's near Dallas, either way. There's yeah. Arlington. There's a Fort Worth there. Uh, a couple <laughs> other areas, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. I used to live in Arlington. I didn't like people saying, are you from Dallas? No, I'm not. I'm from Arlington. It's a different right. county. And now it says on my stream, uh, on my uh, live streaming page, no data. This stream will end shortly unless you restart it with your inner streaming software. Well, I already have it up here. It's streaming right now. Mm. Why is it doing this? I don't know why. This happened the last time when I tried to do a techno stream a couple nights back. Well, how'd you fix it? <clears throat> Well, let me um, let me hear here. So, what, where should I go to settings here? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to so add up settings right now here. Now, I should probably Dave get Dave Rose to help out like he did. Was able to help out the last time there. It's going to take a while for the thing to pop up as always. Uh, I don't know what it was, but a couple of nights ago I tried to do a techno stream, but uh, some reason it stopped out of the blue. I don't know if it was taken down or what it was, but it just, you know, started fucking up. Okay, stream a page, you know, it says uh, right now it's um, ignore stream service and setting recommendations up there, but that needs to be checked. I don't know, but it, because it's running right now, output is, let's see here, it's about video bear rate is 300 kbps. And the audio bit rate is 160. And there's a thing called Enable Advanced Encoder Settings. I don't know if I should check that. Because it says on the bottom of the OBS page, Encoding Overload. As always. It's been doing that for a long while. And I don't know why it's doing that. Let's probably get a hold of Dave you know, and uh, get him on the call here. If he's what? available, we don't. Um, he's banned from my show. I don't oh, mess with him anymore. Okay, there. I see there. So I have to cut. I you know what the hell is going on. Yeah, y'all. My, my bad. You yeah. people, I'm gonna have to have a talking with you people. Well, you don't know what happened this past well, fucking month, Brian. Well, I know. I know. I know what happened the last couple of weeks. I know about that. Yes, I heard about that. That was not cool. Yeah, I, I don't agree. Be, uh... I'll yep. be associating with certain people. Yeah, well, yeah, well, 
I'm going to stay clear of that situation. Here. Mm. I've, been, I've been so busy with my job and everything else here, working these long ass hours, that sometimes my mind goes. Bleh. So I had to be reminded a couple of times here and there. Right. Yeah. All right. So uh, probably when we get get done with the show, I have to um, l help me look over a couple of sh stuff of the shit here because it's driving me fucking nuts. I've been doing this all the time. It's like, what the fuck, bro? Give me a break. Jeez. All right. Now I'm going to the video settings right now. And like it says, it's base canvas resolution um, 112 80 times 720. Hold on a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My shit ain't working. My shit? No, yeah, it is. It is? So it's still up there. Yeah, it's live. It'll don't worry about it. Just Good. keep going because it's live right now. And whenever it, if it skips and stuff, whenever it ends, it'll get everything together on the. All right, there. The video. So All yeah, right. just just we'll keep, keep going. On, keep live. going there. Either way, yeah. that's good to hear. I'm just you know, I'm just sick and tired of that happening. You know, it's been doing that for God knows how long, and it just drives me nuts. You know. At the news, I'm first. Okay. Um, all right now. Uh, I don't have any news. Well, did you ever? Well, really... did you ever get the article I sent about Dave Holland, the ex drummer of Judas Priest, who passed away a couple of years back, and the situation regarding him? It, yes. Yeah, we. Got, I'm gonna try and look it up there and see. Let me find it on the blah blah here. He died though. He yeah, died. I know. Yeah, so remember he did die a couple of years back there. He was about seventy nine years old, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And um, let me look it up here on the blah blah. We don't have our news reader. I know, yeah, he's gone there. Now, I'm going to read this up here. Um, let me go up here on the article here. And this was from, um, it's going to pop up the article right here. It's going to be a couple wild folks here. Now, this has been a long debate amongst uh, fans of Judas Priest for a couple of years. Now, we all know Dave Holland. He was the ex-drummer of Judas Priest from 1980 till 1989 when he left the group. And then here's the thing with what happened here. Former uh, guitarist K.K. Downing's book collaborator claims to have obtained new information about their former drummer Dave Holland, which paints the band's disgraced drummer in a far different light than the public had previously known. Yeah, I knew about this. this yeah, no, yeah. The newly revealed purported details of Holland's final years come 13 months after he died in Lugo, Spain, where the 69-year-old had reportedly been residing after spending several years in a British jail for attempting to rape a special needs teenage boy whom he was giving drum lessons to. The drummer was sentenced in January 2004 for trying to assault the 17-year-old in his cottage in Northamptonshire, England, while giving him drum lessons, as I mentioned. The abuse was re revealed in a letter written by the teenager to his parents. Holland had denied any involvement in the attempted rape of the special needs student and was one point said to be planning on writing a tell-all biography of his life and career. Scottish author and journalist Mark Egg let's see what's his name? Eglogger. Egg okay. Co wrote Kadowney's night two thousand eighteen autobiography, Heavy Duty, Days and Nights in Judas Priest, says that he was given new information but purported friend of Holland's who wanted to inform people of a very sad injustice that had perpetrated upon someone who claims he was a true gentleman. The following mm -hmm. piece was provided to Blabbermouth.net by Ingleton, who requested that it be published in its in full entirety. Here it is. Dave Holland's New Information. <clears throat> in the aftermath of co-writing K.K. Downing's recent book, I being more accessible than he is, was invitedly contacted by a number of people. Some wanted interviews, others wanted to pass on personal messages, or to have books or other items signed. One woman's contact was what of a different nature. She had been a friend of the late Judas Priest drummer, Dave Holland, 
that she had information to share regarding Dave and the court case in which she was convicted in 2004. It is what's important to say that I have personally no opinion of Dave or Dave's case. He was convicted. That is fact. KK and I discussed him only in terms of his condition to Judas Priest from a musical perspective, with only occasional references to his personality as far as far as related to band members. All of them have been positive, by the way, during his 10-year tender with the priesthood. Just like anything one or anyone else, reading what follows. Obviously, I was neither present or at the events in which led to Dave's arrest, nor was Duh. I present to the court case at which he was convicted. Furthermore, even after having given the following information, I'm still not in a personal position to be able to offer an opinion of these matters. The fact remains that Dave Holland was convic convicted of an indefensible crime. But in the spirit of openness and the willingness to share information relayed to me with the acquaintances of Dave, the many fans of Judas Priest and other bands that Holland had associated with, in fact, yes, it was even with uh, Al Atkins, the original frontman, he drummed for him for a while there, it would only seem fit, it would, excuse me, it would only seem right to make people aware of the details of the information. This lady, who has now been spoken to at great length, stated the following in no particular order. And this is from the lady, the lady's mouth herself. Quote, unquote. Dave was the victim of a story that the lady said that was made up by a 17-year-old lad and his older brother. They sometimes frequented Dave's house together, and on occasionally, this lady's son would do the same. Due to some gardening duties on the weekends, on summer holidays, and would occasionally receive drum lessons from Dave himself. The accusing 17-year-old was wrongly reported in places to have been a cripple and in a wheelchair. When he was actually a healthy lad, apparently strong enough to do some gardening duties and play drums. The only disability that he was had was something of a slow learner. So basically he was slow at learning a couple of things like we all like I am at times. Allegedly there was an attempt made by Dave to rape this lad, but there was no physical evidence in the trial, only verbal testimony. Yeah, you can't go by word of mouth anymore when it comes to cases like these. You have to have physical or actual recorded or videotaped evidence. That's not when you're here. Before. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. There was another 22-year-old male alleged. Don't go, Steve Boston. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. There was another 22 a male allegedly involved, but the pre police apprehended offered him a to both. Mm, excuse me. A deal of both freedom and not to be on record as a criminal if he pleaded guilty. This is what he did. This could be argued was detrimental to Dave's plea of innocence. <clears throat> From what the lady also said, the judge presiding over the case was at the least biased, to put it mildly, and he threw out any ab valuable evidence that would have been in David's favor. For example, the prosecution said that the lady's son was also present on the day that the offense was supposed to have taken place. This, as stated by the lady, wasn't the case he, as he was at a wedding with her. Evidential proof of which was submitted in court, yet for some reason the judge did not allow this evidence to be a missive. Also, the accuser's brother, who seemingly had helped conduct the story, was on the run from the police at the time of the trial. So his statement, according to the judge, couldn't be read out in court either. Dave seemingly showed the lady the brother's statement when he received a copy of his release from prison eight years later. He said that the brother admits in the statement that the story about Dave was made up. 
And on top of can everything, you stop saying, can you please stop saying that name on my show, please? What? What? What name? Dave. Holy shit! Yeah, come on, Earl. Well, well, I'm just reading this. What the article just says. Say former, I know, but just say former drummer or something. All I don't right, wanna, all right, yeah. Well, well. On top of everything else, the former priest drummer appointed a defense counsel that was familiar with the defense details, didn't turn up on the day, had me cried off with a cold. So the drummer had to be represented at the last minute by a stand-in defense lawyer who was apparently hopeless. A bad lawyer, they got him at the last minute there. The drummer served his years in prison when eventually got out. One of his main intentions was to look after his dying mother, feeding, toiling her daily. According to the lady, the lady also said that the drummer was also brilliant with her son and her baby granddaughters, and he was a true gentleman. Not too long afterwards, the drummer's mother passed away, and so, after the funeral, the drummer decided to try and start a new life for himself in Spain. Mm. Only days after Spain, the drummer went to the doctor, complaining of stomach pains, and was diagnosed with cancer of the liver and the lungs. In less than two weeks, he passed away. Wow. Yeah. Well, I remember him. He um, and he was in like in Priest before. Yeah. Um, before Scott Travis. Yeah. Obviously, in the nineties, he was in the eighties and yeah, he maybe was. earlier. But he was the guy with the mustache. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's right. And he was the one. Hot of, Rockin'. Hot, hot Rockin', rockin the Point of Entry, all those albums yeah. like Screaming for Vengeance. Um, all except Ram It Down, basically, there. Because they use a drum machine on that album there. Really? Yeah, they did. And you listen to the drums, how it sounds. It's definitely a drum machine for Shizzle. He also played on the also played on the live like album. Pre- hmm? Go ahead. Basically drum machine, which is basically a pre-recorded um, sequence, basically. Or I don't. I don't know what what the idea was. Back in track. Something like yeah. that. I do not know. You know, there were. I know Scott Travis was able to drum perfectly when they performed Blood Red Skies. When you saw them, that's for sure. Yes. Yeah. Now. <clears throat> Okay, all of the drummer's family is now gone, and as neither of nor his disabled sister, a sufferer of multiple sclerosis, ever married. This lady had not long lost her own husband, and it's apparent that she is still pretty much disturbed at what happened to the drummer. Also, it seems that she has nothing whatsoever to gain by giving her account after so many years, other than trying to bring some clarity to this case by any last allowing fans, people who knew the drummer, to be aware of what she has only described as a very sad injustice. In reporting of the drummer's passing, the Spanish newspaper El Progreso said that he had lived discreetly in a secluded part of Spain, secluded, secluded, yeah, in Spain, had been described by the neighbors who knew him as a very kind and polite individual. The drummer joined the Judas Priest in 1979 after Les Binks left the group and stayed with the band for a decade and played on their classic albums like British Steel, Point of Entry, Scream for Vengeance, Defenders of the Faith, Turbo, and of course their live album Priest Live in 1987. He, was, he left the band in 1989. It was replaced by Scott Travis, who is still in the group to this day. He was also a founding member of the band Trapeze, which featured Glenn Hughes, prior to him joining Deep Purple, and a guitar player named Mel Gowry. And I guess uh, he was, as I mentioned earlier, he was also involved with Ritual Priest frontman Al Atkins for a while there. His bandmates from a previous group called Finders Keepers as well there alright so that's the article I wanted to bring up courtesy of blabbermouth.net and uh, somehow some reason that whole thing you know, of regarding him was just may have been a very miscarriage of justice when you think about it there but 
Unfortunately, you know, he, Dave is not around to uh, live to see this information call, come out there. All right. So, um, um, very sad, the situation there, unfortunately, there. All right, so on to the main topic here. As you know, we're going to be t- taking a look at keyboard players within the music industry, whether it's rock, funk, jazz, um, music, anything uh, in general there. Industrial, have a lot of feel on the industrial list, that's for sure there, because I'm a listener of industrial music, as you know. All right there, so how, how we, whose turn is it, by the way? Is it gonna, are we going to gonna do go Ark? First. Okay there. Yeah, and then, just you and Ark, just you and Ark, because I don't have a list. Oh, only, okay there. You know. All right there. My okay, first or one is a, the only people. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, my ahead. my first one is possibly one. Well, it's definitely one of my top five. Might even be my first. Mm-hmm. Keith Emerson. Oh, obviously, yeah, the big daddy of there. He was the big wig of the uh, prog rock world there. The guy, from I understand, you know, according to one of his band members, the late Greg Lake, said that. He had a big warehouse full of IBM computers and everything else to help translate the works of those classic composers onto uh, the way he could, man. And he was able to do that a lot. I mean, let's not forget the uh, crazy keyboard solos he would do on during those early ELP shows there. He would stick a knife between the the keys there to keep him going there while he did other things with the other, other end of the keyboard as well. He would also throw his key organ around to do some solos on there while jumping down to the crowd and just doing that, playing along, whether it was on the Sydney on the ground, this and that. Yeah, and he'd, he'd ride the thing like a like a horse, you know, bucking Absol- bronc. Absolutely. And let's not forget the flying piano solo he did at the California Jam, where yeah. he would uh, the piano would levitate from uh, some sort of a lever, some sort of crate lever, and it would turn around and around. Of course. Emerson had to wear a seatbelt during that stint there. Yeah. All right there. So we <clears> mentioned <throat> Keith Emerson. It's sad that he, was he had also, to go so, so. And go he ahead. was also a member of the NICE. Yeah, that's true. You Emerson mentioned that. Palmer. Yeah, you mentioned that as well. There was a compilation of his work with the Knights just as well there that came out. I remember seeing. All right there. So it's my turn here. Right. Okay, my, my first on the list have to be someone from Toronto, originally from Toronto, Canada, but moved to um, Vancouver. He was responsible for one of the most influential industrial groups to emerge out of Vancouver, Skitty Puppy. I'm talking about a guy named Kevin Crompton. Uh, um, pre- he was previously a drummer for a group called Images in Vogue, which released a couple of albums in his native Canada there. He would depart from the group in the early 80s after hooking up with a poet and a supposed singer named Nevak Ogre, real name Kevin Ogavi. They would form a group called Skitty Puppy that would help along with other bands like Night Baden and Throbbing Gristle, Joy Division. They would help. They would basically be one of the pioneers of industrial music. They released classic albums like Remission, Bites, Mind the Perpetual Intercourse, one of the one that got me hooked on them called Cleanse, Fold, and Manipulate, um, Vivis Sex 6, Last Rites, Two Dark Park, The Process, Mythmaker, The Greater Wrong, The Right, you know, the recent one that came out in 2003 called The Weapon, actually just Weapon, my bad. He also has a lot of projects on the side there, like Plateau, Doubting Thomas, uh, Download. Now, Doubting Thomas was him and uh, one of the other guys I'm going to mention later on, Dwayne Gattel, who passed away in 1995. Uh, It was a site. They did this one album called The Infidel 1991. Came out on Wax Shacks in that year. I remember listening to it while I was going to go see the band Pig Face play at Todd's on Seven Mile Van Dyke. It was a snowy afternoon there. I got I got the day off from my job at that time. And so I was listening to that on the way there. And the by the way, the Infidel album has also been re, was reissued on Metropolis Records. 
He also played. He also had a whole bunch of extra tracks. And on vinyl, the vinyl format is released on the Canadian label called Artifact Records. I'm looking to purchase that sometime soon if I ever see it or, or mail order it. And it's a three album set. Kevin Key is my s- first choice. And he also, oh, I've always forgot, he also had a project with uh, Edward Cospell of the legendary Pink Dots called The Tear Garden. The song, The Center Bullet, still a classic to this very damn day. There you go. Okay. All right. Number two for me is also among my top five. He was a member of an iconic group from the 70s, and he uh-huh. had an outstanding solo career, Rick Wakeman. Oh, yeah, that's right. Rick Wakeman from Yes. And I think it's tons. I think he has a son named Todd that did uh, keyboard work for uh, Ozzy Osbourne as well. Wow. On those live shows, if I'm correct. Hmm. Let me look it up there. Uh, let's see here. Blah, blah, blah. But Rick Wakeman had some iconic stuff in Yes. Close to the Edge. Yep. And his solo work, The um, Eight Wives of Henry the no, Six seven wi- Wives. Six, Henry six, six Wives. My bad. Blah, blah, blah. And then okay. the Journey to the Center of the Earth, which is an epic 30-minute thing. Which All actually right there. is longer than that. It's almost 40 minutes. Yeah. But he basically know. did the book. All right there. With a full orchestra and choir. And, uh, a, and a narrator as well there. Yep. I uh, know. I'm trying to find the name of his son who worked with Ozzy Osbourne. I know. I think it was Adam Wakeman. Yeah. All right. He's a keyboard. He's a keyboard player and um, guitarist for. Let's see here. Let me look up for it and make sure. All right. One blah 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 blah. He also worked with Ozzy's old band Black Sabbath just as well there. And um, damn, for that, I hate this computer. Okay. Adam Wakeman is an English musician, current keyboardist and rhythm guitarist for Ozzy Osbourne Band. He also played keyboards on off stage for Black Sabbath. He also also worked with Andy Lennox, Travis, The Company of Snakes, Will Young, Victoria Beckham, Atomic Kitten, and Martin Bear, the former um, Jethro Tull guitarist. He's also collaborated with his father, Rick Wakeman, and was released albums with him. He also put it out solo albums. And he created his own, his own band called Headspace with Damian Wilson. Never heard of him, but he was on a tour with Ozzy during, I remember seeing him on that one free Ozfest festival that I went back in 2007 there. All right. So there you go. All right. The, the legacy of Rick Wakeman goes on and on and on. And it's your turn. Okay. Okay. The second on my list is Dwayne Rudolph Cotel. He was he joined the Skinny Puppy back in 1986 through when their other uh, keyboard player Bill Lieb left to pro- perform his own group, Frontline Assembly, which I will get to later on in the show. Cotel was contributing. He contributed a lot to the Skinny Puppy sound and uh, songwriting just as well there. In fact, uh, he was the one behind, apparently the one mostly behind the piece Download that closed it out, the album Last Rites from 1992. He said it took about over three months to make that track because it included a lot of sounds, a lot of effects. And guys, you have to listen to the whole piece in general to see what I'm talking about there. It is a trip to listen to, no doubt. Now, Gotel was also instrumental. He was kind of like the, um, he was kind of like the programmer, just as well there. And sadly, he passed away in 1995 from a heroin overdose, and nobody knew that he was doing heroin to the the extent that he was at that time. Because at that time, Puppy was going through issues with when the band members, their record label at that time, tried to record this one record, and. Uh, that the story about how that band broke up at that time almost was comparable to the Beatles breakup years before. No doubt about that. Gotel would have probably would have been in his forties uh, if he had still had. Actually, it would have been in his fifties. I mean, as I say, if he was still around there, 
it could have uh, did him, as I mentioned, him and Kevin Key did a lot of projects together, like Downey Thomas, the two, uh, the first download album, and uh, a couple other things as well. He also had a project on the side called Hilt, just to mention there, it's just as well there. So, rest in peace, Dwayne Gattel, Skinny Puppy, you know, you were the quiet one, but you were also the noisy one, just as well there. Okay, staying with guys that uh, that are well known. Okay, I'm gonna go with Elton John and. Oh yeah, well, yeah I was gonna be... say something now. All right, there, yeah. If you're still so. here, all right, there. Well, he was, of course, you know, we know he was the subject of um of a movie called um Rocket Man that came out not too long ago. I guess uh, biography movies of rock stars are the main thing now. We had the yeah. Queen one. We had the Elton John one. Will we see a Black Sabbath one pretty soon? Oh, let's not forget the Motley Crue one about a year or two ago. Yeah, and there's a huge body of work here. I mean, Absolutely. I think he's still on tour right now, I guess it was. It's called the Farewell Yellow Brick Road Tour, I think it's called. Wow. Uh, have you ever seen him in concert? No, I never did. I never got a chance to. I'm not that much into him, but you got to give him his rec for playing piano the way he, as cool as he does. And he does have some very iconic songs. I know, um, yeah. There was, I only had one album of his, and it was called 21 at, I think it's 22 at 33, I think it was. It came out in 1980. And the reason I had 21 got at 33? That, 21 at 33. Yes, thank you. Is that the uh, little genie on it? Yes, it's a little genie. I remember hearing, I was a big fan of that song uh, back in 1980. I remember hearing that a couple of times at the, um, this one beach that my ma took me for my birthday. And it was in the St. Clair Shores area. And what's really cool about it is that, you know, hearing that song with the looking out in the ocean there, it's like, oh, excuse me, you're looking out in the water, my bad. But still, it was... It was kind of magical when you think about it. So when I think about, when I hear that song nowadays, I think about that moment. Yeah. I think my favorite by him was Honky Chateau with Honky Cat, Rocket Man, um, Mona Lisa and Man Across Manhattan's. the Water. Man, Man Across too. the Water. Yeah, absolutely there. Now, the only one they play, usually play at his, at my workplace is usually I'm Still Standing. And when you think about it, oh, that was one cheesy ass video when you look at it there. <laughs> but yeah, at the that time, was that was a spectacular to look two, at. Two thousands, I think. I, I don't remember exactly when. It came, it came out. The video came out in a two, 1982 or 1983. There, I think it was one of those two years. Well, Mad Men Across the Water featured Tiny Dancer. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Levon and Razor Levon. Face. Yeah. Danielle as well there. No, that one's we, on Don't Shoot Me. Oh, yeah. And he wrote this interesting song. I think he was one of the first writers to explore lesbianism. Remember the song All the Girls Love Alice from the yeah. Yellow Goodbye Yellow Break Road album? That was about lesbians. And he was, I think, one of the first guys to talk about that. Yeah, that uh, those early albums were basically used Bernie Taupin to write the uh, lyrics. Yeah, absolutely, because he couldn't... Phenomenal. They are. And, uh, the, in fact, there was a tribute album that came out in 1989 called Two Rooms. You know, that was featured, uh, including a cool cover of, uh, of Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. And, of course, that song, also the band Flotsam and Jetsam did that, did that song with Elton doing the piano work on that song as well there. Yeah. I understand there. <laughs> And the funny thing is the reason it was called Two Rooms is because that's how they wrote music. Elton B. was in one room and Bernie B. in another. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's your turn. Okay. This one, you know, it deserves a nod mention because he was a part of the band that I'm going to mention later on. Or actually, I'm going to mention right now. Ladies one line. and gentlemen. Blah, blah, blah. There you are. Yep. Jeez, how you doing, dude? He's still wearing Next. your outfit. No, I changed. Sorry. Oh, okay, there. Uh, 
I know I know one plant piano player by heart. All right. Liberace. Mm, uh, that's true. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, the original Elton John. When you think about it, in terms of glamming it up and stage, this uh, stage clothing. Keith, how do you know about him? Uh, hmm. I I actually heard Ken talking about Liberace, and I looked him up, and I looked mm-hmm. I looked up to his to his videos on YouTube. Ah, uh, and you got to give him back, give him credit he because was a good he was one. Player. He was, yeah, absolutely there. Yeah, uh, Ken. I think Ken was like, uh, "Oh, Tony's trying to be the next Liberace." Huh, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was, yeah, shit. Instead of being yeah. the next Liberace, be the first Tony. Yeah. Right. Mm. Well, yeah, I, I mean, love... he might he might be doing that. Yeah, I mean, he's doing that right now, being the first Tony. But the problem is, it's a bad Tony. Oh uh, yeah. Strong guys with the drama. Okay. I know, yeah, but still we had to get that out there. Okay, Earl, it's your turn. Keyboard player. Oh, keyboard player, okay. This guy was a member of Frontline Assembly for a couple, for many years there. He left the group in uh, after uh, 1997. He came back to the group a few years later. He's still with the. It's him and uh, Bill Lieb, who, as I mentioned earlier, he did remixing for the uh, band Fear Factory. He mm-hmm. also was uh, him and Lieb where they had a project called a couple of times called Noise Unit and Delirium. They released a number of albums as well there. Reese Fulber from Frontline Assembly oh is my the next on my is on my list there as well there. He did a lot of stuff for the did he uh, had affiliation with Fear Factory? No. Well he only rem- helped remix some of their albums. Like um look up two albums that um he did a uh, remix it on. Fear is the Mind Killer, which he did with Lieb. It's a, that's an EP. And Remanufactured, which featured uh, mixes from Reese himself. Hello. Hello. Is Fear Factory. <laughs> Could y'all hear me? I was talking. Oh, you're going to hear. I was explaining it to you. The, oh, it, it was yeah. Fear Factory, like, because I remember them, like, concerts in the 2000s. Were they yeah. a newer group well, or? Well, when I heard, first heard of them, it was at end. I think they'd been around a decade earlier because Fear is the Mind Killer, the EP that I mentioned, which I had on vinyl, European vinyl. Um, that came out in 1993. So they've been uh, pretty much you know, uh, around earlier than that, I guess, or a couple of years before that, I meant to say. But a remanufacture a remix album of the manufactured their official album, pretty good album to listen to. As long along with Fear Is the Mind Killer, both badass records, no doubt. All right. Okay, my next guy. As far as I know, was only in one band before he went solo, and mm-hmm. I do not remember the name of the band off the top of my head. They only had one album. And from what I understand, it's actually a pretty good psychedelic album. Uh, and this guy is by the name of Billy Joel. Uh, and you know what? I'm, at my workplace, I'm starting to see a lot of his releases be reissued on vinyl, celebrating 50 years of Billy Joel's music there. Stormfront, Piano Man, Glass Houses. And he had a lot of hits. Ton lots of them. and lots of hits. I know there. You uh, know. <laughs> I guess he still. I guess he, I guess he was one of the first rock stars to go, and since Elton John, to really go over across to Russia before the Soviet Union collapsed a couple of years later. There. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, credit to him, the piano Keith. man. Quick sidebar here, Keith. Keith. <sighs> He's on mute. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened you with are. your um, your banquet tonight? I thought you were going late. Uh, it it ended at seven, which I didn't. It's seven p.m. Eastern. Uh, I didn't know actually what time it ended, but I was just assuming it ended at ten. But it ended at seven, and we left like at six forty-five. Dang! Did you win? No, no there's no winning. They didn't <laughs> give you a participation just, trophy. No, no, nothing like that. It was just like it was hanging up. It's a. It, it's gonna hang up for the whole month. Uh, people might buy it if they want it. Uh, no, no one bought it. 
No, I don't think anyone bought anything tonight. But mm. well, which it, it's fine, but um, it's uh, it's gonna hang up all month in in this art center, <clears throat> an hour away from me. All right, dear. I see. Did you have another one there, uh, Keith? Yeah. The other keyboard uh, player, other than Luke Barashi? Oh, yeah. I, ha I have one. All right, go ahead, Wire. Leon Russell, would you consider Leon Russell a keyboard player? Absolutely, he's on my list. Yes, yes he, uh, he's a piano player there. He released a number of albums as well. He was on my list. Absolutely, nice. All right. All right, so is your, your, your turn, Ark, or mine? Keith. Oh. If he has Scott, one. Scott Stewart. And uh, I'll tell you about like, oh, I know I've heard of him, yeah. Um, So the reason why I say he's a piano player is because Scott Stewart and Timberland were beefing with each other like 10 years ago. And, and Timberland was like, Timberland said to Scott Stewart, you're just a piano. You're not a real producer. You're just a piano player. Uh, Mars is correct in the chat. He was the first to mention uh, Liberace. Wow. He... All right. Oh, oh, shout, shout, shout out to Ooh, Mars, was... man. Mars. Hey. Hey, for that. hey, Mars, want to join on the show, dude? We'd like to have you on. No, he don't. Mars, I wasn't here for the show. Well, we, started, you well, only we missed two or three. Well, oh, we only okay. started about a half hour later, a half hour ago there. All right. All right, you're up, Earl. Okay, my next, the next one on my list, you know, passed away in uh, 2008 from cancer, and um, you gotta agree. And we all mentioned this. He did get a bum deal from one of the lead members of this group that he was involved in for many years, Pink Floyd, mm -hmm. Rick oh, yeah. Wright, Richard Wright. He was fired by Roger Waters during the making of the Wall. He was kept on as a session player, but, and uh, he was later, you know, he later, you know, disappeared. He came back in 1987, but he was not officially in the back in the group there. They had to wait till about when the division came back or came out in 1994 for him to make up now some day. He was officially back in the band there. So I don't know why it took so long for him to, um, I don't know why it would take so long. For him to uh, be be uh, brought back into the band because he was still brought on as a side man five piece. at that time, yeah, yeah, five five piece. It was uh, no at the time. Well, during the later years up to their uh, official disbandment in two thousand four. I'm saying was, what again? I'm saying he was a side piece. Yeah, he was oh, okay there. I'm sorry, just said like five a, piece a, there, like an extra, bad. like a yeah, absolutely. But you know what? The good thing about that being a side piece. As I mentioned in the, the details, we were discussing the Wall album and the shows that followed afterwards. When you were doing the performances of the Wall, the other three members of the Floyd, Mason, Gilmore, and Waters didn't really make the money because all of that money that they had went towards the production. The stage, uh, the bricks, the inflatable characters like the teacher, the, uh, the, the schoolmaster, and because... Wright was just a session player, along with the other session players they had in the back, like Snowy White and a few others, and the backup singers they had. He was the only one in the group who actually made money. <clears throat> okay, so so Richard Wright, you know, definitely deserves a big nod because his contribution to the to those early, especially the early works of Pink Floyd, like the Moore soundtrack. Amagama, metal, the piece echoes with that metal section of that piece there where you had that keyboard sounded like a bird caulking in the night. Yeah, that's definitely. Oh, that. Yep. Yeah, well, something like that. You've never heard the piece echoes, have you? Yeah. Oh, definitely check it out, man. Yo, you're missing out. That is a trip of a piece to listen to 25 penis minutes penis long what? man penis what it's called no it's a piece oh it's a track it's called uh, echoes yeah definitely worth a listen dude definitely yeah you have the biggest piece in the community confirmed yeah 
<laughs> no. I... A 16 oh, by 3. A 16 or what? Did y'all mention um, uh, not really known for it, obviously more known for the guitar, but Eddie? And yes, him? and we got to include him because he was also a good keyboard player as well there. Especially in the, uh, the Hagar years there. he got Yeah, the, especially a lot more in the Hagar years, absolutely. You know, in fact, he was prevented from using keyboards on the earlier Van Halen records with David Roth. And period, the reason being is because Rock was like, you're a guitar player, no one wants to see your ass on the keyboard. And plus, at that time, Van Halen was like considered major rock, and uh, anything from the keyboard would be considered selling out. So what they had to do was, to believe it or not, they had to record, what they did is uh, for the track and the Cradle of Rock from Woodman Children First, that was actually uh, Eddie playing a Rhodes keyboard through a stack of, stack of Marshalls. Mm. Yeah, did you... It's, Go ahead, Keith. Did you know Dr. Dre mentioned Liberace in one of his songs? Okay. Yeah, he's like, I got all these diamonds on. Watch me. Hello. This is not a rap like show. Liberace. Not a rap show. Keith, hello. I'm just saying the part about Liberace. Ah, he was this is not okay. about Dr. Dre. Thank you. My yo, turn. yo, Liberace, I did. Did you see that? There is a movie, um, like a... Uh, Liberace movie and it's played by um plays Liberace, damn it. It's not about Dr. Dre, but I was I was saying it about Liberace. Hold on, I'm about to Oh, you know who played Liberace? It was um, in that movie a detailed book about him and his uh, limo driver Michael, uh, brother. Michael what's his name? Mm, mm, Douglas. Douglas. Michael, Michael Douglas. Douglas, played, Michael Douglas? Oh wow! Played the Brachi, yes. This oh, came wow. out like four or five years ago, and oh, wow. it was like a Netflix thing. I don't even. I was something like that. It was like I remember, there was, I remember there was one that came out years before the, um, the detail on the affair that he had with his limo driver. That's Scott guy. What is his name? Is hmm. I don't know what, but Mike. either way, hey there. All right. Your return arc, or I think it is long time member of a pretty iconic band, Deep Purple, <laughs> John Lord. John Lord, yes, definitely, yeah. The name of that movie is called Behind the Candelabra. Uh, 2013, okay 2013, it came out. All right, there. Over on the subject of John Lord, <laughs> right there. He was in Mark and One, I, Mark Two, Mark Three, and beyond. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, and he retired, and he was replaced by the next guy on my list, Don um, Ivory. I think his last name his name is. If uh, I think it's Don Ivory. He also uh, did a work with um, not only uh, Rainbow. He also worked with on um, Black Sabbath, two albums with Ozzy in the seventies there. And why are is my is am I lagging on my uh, end there? Can you check for me? Yeah. Son of a bitch. I don't no, know I'm, gonna I'm, check. I'm gonna check. I'm gonna check. I'm gonna check. Is it? No, my it's good. It's all good. Sure. Because it's like because it's look like it's yeah. lagging, but yeah. what? Up? Brown. 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 It's all good, brother. Yeah. All right. Good. Okay. Now let's go. Because I see the time is still going. Thank goodness. Keith. Yeah. Uh, Mozart. Oh. oh, well, you went back ways, going, but yes, that's true. Yeah, I, 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 I got to give him credit, but, you know, Johann Sebastian Bach, Tchaikovsky, all those guys, they were like one of the major influences on the prog rock scene when you think about it there. Mm -hmm. Eric Sasowski? Yep. What? Oh, it's back to me? Yeah, it's, I think it's back to you, man. Okay, let's see. Richard Wright was my next one, so I'll skip to Tony Banks. Ah. Genesis. There you go. I do have a question, a side piece question, but okay. Was there a pianist on the Oak Ridge Boys group? Uh, Famous or a name? Uh, not that I know of. I don't have any Oak Ridge Boys. I'm in trying my to think of. I'm trying to think of groups. Uh, right. Well, the Oak Ridge Boys were basically a four-man quartet. 
that was fronted and then Singing. backed by a band. Yep. Well, I wonder who their piano is. That's what I'm saying. Like any group I that had do on not a regular. No. Probably I mean, a like session guy, but I could be wrong. What about the Beach Boys? Live. Oh. Um, uh, Brian uh, Wilson played for them a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's true there. Yeah. And I and think at one time, Captain, Captain of Captain Neil also did for a little while. Yeah, but Daryl Dragon. Daryl, uh, yeah, I couldn't think of his name. Yeah, Daryl Dragon. That was his name. He's no longer with us, unfortunately. Does Mars have a candelabra? Hmm. I know. You go, let's find out. Mars, you have one? <laughs> what okay, you got, Mars? Earl? Okay, the next one on my list is considered the master of the Mellotron. He played with the Moody Blues on the Damn. core seven albums and a couple few afterwards. Well, not necessarily one afterwards. Um, and uh, apparently the story was that his exit from the group came about from some sort of an incident where him and Justin Hayward were writing a song. They were so into it. And then all of a sudden, drummer Graham Edge came in, started trying to interrupt them, try to get their attention. And Pinder just went off on the Graham Edge for that. And he sent in a couple of interviews, said he was very sorry he did that. You know, he is uh, meant to tell this person to tell Edge that. But for some reason, I, I don't know what the real whole details of what happened on the partying from, from the Moody Blues. But well, I heard a Mike lot of it had Pinder, to do with his uh, location where he was when they were recording, and it was tough for him. Uh, I see there. But Mike Pinder, or Pinder, definitely deserves a not on the list because of the way he was, because he was considered the master of the Mellotron. We listened to all those Moody Blues albums. Yeah, yeah. Big, big deal for them. Yeah, it was. He was. That's one of the big reasons why I got into the Moody Blues was because of the Mellotron. Yeah. And my next one is commonly known as there's several of them but this guy was known as the fifth beetle because he was prominent in the let it be sessions and yep. that would be billy preston who had a solo yep. career yep. of his own yeah something for no i guess it's called what's something it called from nothing something yep, from something leaves nothing Yep, absolutely. That was the name of the song. That was one of those big hits. And let's not also forget his rendition of the song Get Back for the Sgt. Pepper Lonely Hearts Club Band film from 79, 78 there. All right. Uh, okay. Is it my turn? Sure. Mm -hmm. Beethoven. Oh, yeah. Got to give a I'm thinking that character shorter for the Peanuts comics. Something, though. something, something, something. You better, you better get, get something. something. Yo, did y'all watch that uh, Beatles documentary yet? I want to watch it. I was uh, <laughs> got to watch get it. Some, bro. I got to listen. I do. I, I just never had time because I'm when I come home, I'm like, I'm so tired. But you know what? One of these days when there's nothing to do, when they have, when you have. No, I'm I'm so used to going out and do things. It become a habit with me. But next time when I to visit my nephew, he's just going to have Disney Plus set up, and we're going to definitely watch it. It's long. I haven't watched yeah. it, but I heard it's long. Well, How it's three long parts, is it? uh, over two hours apiece. Three ah, parts okay, that I know of. That's understandable. Keith and Mars has the biggest penis in the community. That is confirmed. By who? That's right. Uh, okay. <laughs> By who? The community. Hmm. Uh, okay. And we as guys are interested. Why? I'm saying people. There's a lot of you know groupies out there that are. You know what I'm saying? This is the music show. Oh, uh, why? Are, did you show? Did you show the picture I sent you today? I sent you <laughs> yeah, we're gonna put that. Yeah, we're gonna put it on the screen right now. Right there. That looks like fucking GQ magazine right now, Keith. Um, like for real, total transformation. Yep. Mm. Put that in the chat. Uh, just put it in the chat, Keith. I don't even oh. have it. All oh right. wait, I got it. I got it. Here we go. All right, bro. This guy looks like the Miz or something. He really looks like the Miz. All right. Yeah, I do. Be it. Check it out here. He All right. Pardon me for not checking it out. 
Okay, it should be in the chat, in the group chat right here right now. I see what you're talking about. Well, there. right, right. Yeah, I see, I see, yeah. Look good, and look good there, Keith, there. Thank you. All right. Got the can right now, please. This guy has Timberland boots on and shit, Jordans or something. Look at this. I see, oh, you yeah. look like the Miz from WWE. Almost like the Miz, yeah, there. Oh, yeah, this is the Mrs. Uh, in-ring get-up. That haircut and beard. Yep. yep. Keith, you got, the, you got the fresh, you got the 20. You tip them or no? Yeah, right. it was twenty-two dollars, and I gave it a five-dollar tip. Okay, this is expensive than uh, the other haircuts I've heard about. Would you get that shirt, Coles? Yes, Coles. Nice. Oh, I see. We have yeah, a Coles near us to where we live. Incidentally, there. Good guy yeah. too. Good casual wear. Okay, yep. and why does it uh, look like it looks like it's still lagging on my end? What the fuck? Uh, yeah, a little bit behind. Your when We're my down. hand goes up, your, when my hand goes up, your mouth goes shut. <laughs> okay, my hand's up right now. Okay, yeah, music show. Okay. Remember? Okay, yeah, let's do this. All right, I, I the next. That's one. the myth. Okay, that's I'm, what the myth. Is. All right, we're great. My I know that. Okay, okay let okay. me talk. Okay, the next one on my list was that guy. He basically come up with one of the most interesting 80s hits of all time. She Blinded Me with Science. Oh. Ooh. Thomas Dolby. And he, he also did some uh, work on the um, backup work on the Foreigner 4 album, just as well there. He also played with a singer named Lydia Lunch on a couple of her albums, including New Toy. In fact, the video for that song, he appears on with her, appears with in the in, with the band as well. Now Thomas Dolby, his release, he's um, he was known for a while for trying to make the keyboard not sound like a keyboard. You know, he know there are the songs like Europa and the Pirate Twins, which was another hit. Um, one of my personal favorites from him, um, one of our submarines, which is a damn good song. <clears throat> Radio Silence, I guess it's called as well there, and um. I remember me and my best friend Dennis saw him at the Ritz and Rose in 1988 when they released an album called Aliens Ate My Buick. And it was a pretty good show that he did, you know, except for the obnoxious drunk ass fool who was like, Mr. Dobby, where you are, come on stage, Mr. Dobby. And everyone was about to knock the hell out of him. In fact, one other person said to us, you know, if he falls, let him, don't pick him up. <laughs> Switch we didn't. Well, he almost got to the point where he almost, he almost got in a fight with somebody there. So, think of this, that moron was gone. But that fool was annoying as fuck. <clears throat> All right. All right. My next one is a member of two fairly large groups, not just one. Mm. In the 60s and 70s. In the 60s, he was a member of the Zombies. And uh, Rod Argent. On, and then moved on to Argent. Uh-huh. His band, Rod Argent. Yeah. Pretty good keyboard player. Yeah, it's good to hear. Yeah. The work he did on the song Time of the Season was pretty damn good as well when you look at it. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And the original God Gave Rock and Roll to you. Absolutely there. Okay, and my next on my list is a guy who... Oh, uh, the Kiss covered that song? Uh, not, no, not, not well, kind of, but not Sarah. They changed it up a little bit. Uh, yeah, So they, and they called their version, God Gave Rock and Roll to You, you number two. Remember that, remember that song that um, Paul Stanley did, and he, he wrote it, and it sounded just like Pour Some Sugar on Me? Well, which one was that? Uh, I think it's on Asylum, one of the 80s records. Okay, um, Probably I'm not. Some I saccharin on me. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I, um, I didn't. I didn't have the asylum record, so I wouldn't know. Okay, you, the next one Keith on my Blair. list. Oh, is this my my turn? Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, um. He forgot. I just, oh, Stevie, Stevie. Tony Wood. from Revi Oh. Who? What? Oh gosh, Stevie Wonder. Oh yeah, 
Yeah, I got to give him credit there. He was a damn good keyboard player. Yeah. And I am lagging. Yeah, Ray Charles. Okay, okay, Ray Charles. Yes. Okay, yes. Another keyboard player. He was an player. Keith was he was African American. Keith. Yes, I saw the movie. Ray with Jamie Foxx. Yes. Yep, and um, credit to him, he was able to beat heroin addiction. Yes. Yep. Yep. Cocker Earl. Okay, the next one on my list uh, was a member of Rainbow in the 70s there with Richie Blackmore, Ronnie James Steel. And also, um, he had a, had a couple of solo records in the 80s there. And he also had a side project as well called the Planet P Project, Mr. Tony Carey. Hmm. And I got to figure out what the fuck is up with my uh, settings I'm trying to remember here. I need the help. hit from Planet P. Why, Why me? me? Why me? That's yep. it. Yeah. Absolutely. That's it. I like that song. A yeah, good song there. Also, another album is yeah, that he put it out was Pink World, a concept album worth checking out from 1984. I'm up. Yes, you're up. Okay, this guy is also in several groups. You'll guess him pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Spencer Davis Group. I am. Traffic. Blind Faith. Steve Winwood. Oh, yeah. And I guess uh, he's uh, doing the opening uh, slot for Steely Dan's current tour as well there. Wow. Also a phenomenal singer, but that might come up on our singing bit. All right. All right. Is it okay. My turn? Oh. Sure. Go after. Your turn. Your turn, dude. Uh, John Legend. John Legend. Yeah, he's an R and B singer from. Who plays piano? Oh uh, yeah, someone's calling me. I'll be back. Yeah. I get one is one of his big hits. Right. Okay, and I guess it's my turn now. Yep. Okay. All right. Why are he interjects when he thinks of one? Okay. I got to mention this guy there. I became a fan of his uh, accidentally back in 2012 when I was with my girlfriend in Detroit, but I moved back to Detroit. Um, this guy was one time a member of Tangerine Dream. Um, he re- he would start his first solo record after departing from that group. Didn't feature no synthesizers, but it featured a organ played through a um, guitar amplifier to make it sound different, and an orchestra to boot. It was in three movements. Other albums he released it afterwards, including the double album Cyborg, uh, another one called Black Dance, Dune, the soundtrack to a German movie called Body Love, and he's worked with um, Lisa Gerard from the Dead Can Dance. His name is Klaus Schultz, or Schultz, because of the E in the end there. Right. And the records I recommend are the ones I mentioned, including Earlicht, which is uh, the three movement album, which came out in 1972. I heard that. It was like, wow, that's a trip to listen to for Shizzle. Okay, my next one. Just passed recently mm-hmm. was the was a mainstay of a group by the name of Procol Harum. Wow, Matthew Gary Brooker. Fisher. Oh, okay, my bad. But I think um, Gary Brooker was the keyboard player as well in that group, if I'm correct. A lot of keyboards in that group. I see there, yeah. <clears throat> uh, do, I, do I go after Doctor Earl? No, you go after me. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're, you're in the middle. It's uh, Ark, you and me. That's how it's and Byer just comes in once in a while when he thinks of one. All right. Is it my turn? Sure. It's your turn. Martha Ardridge. Oh, Martha nice. Par- Martha Partridge? Ardridge. Ardridge. 
Martha Partridge from the Partridge oh. family. No, a- that's Shirley Partridge. No, A R G E R I C A. Ardrey. It's hard to hear you up in the background, dude. Okay, so give us some does, detail. What, yeah, what does he uh, play keyboards for? Uh, the world woke up to the phenomenal talent of the Argentinian pianist Martha Ardridge. Martha, in uh, 1964, uh, when she won the international uh, Chopin. It doesn't say the rest. Chopin. That's his uh, predictor uh, pronunciation. All right. Keith is going for obscure. Good for him. Mm. Hey. Good. My yeah. time. Okay. The next one on my list, you know, is uh, was a, a member, as I mentioned earlier, was a member of Skitty Puppy in the, uh, a couple of their earlier albums. He also he left the group in '86 to form his own group, known as Frontline Assembly, and uh, he's. St- I guess we're going to be coming to a Numbers Nightclub in May there. So I got to get possibly get a day off to check that show out there on a Saturday. Mr. Bill Lieb is next on my list here. They released the phenomenal albums like Corrosion, Disorder, Hardwired, Millennium, um, stuff like Artificial Soldier, you know, The Intentional Command. Okay. Yep. Next guy I got you possibly have heard of. Yep. Greg Allman. Um, from the Allman Brothers and the Greg Allman Band as well. And one time ex-husband of Cher. Yeah. Probably one of the shortest, probably the, you know, lot, probably with the pioneer of the shortest marriage. You know, when you think well, about it there. It was long enough to have a kid. That's true there, yeah. Elijah Blue. Who they appear with his mom in the video for "If I Could Turn Back Time" when she wore that um, revealing outfit there? Yeah, I imagine that went over real big with everybody. Oh yeah, a lot of people. A lot of people were uh, complaining about that. Is it my turn? Sure, your turn. Vladimir Horowitz. Oh wow. Oh, that's interesting. I just. Uh, I, uh, Piano player. All right, there. Ah, nice. Yeah. All right, there. The next one on my list is going to be um, basically it's all three at one. And these were all the this this is the classic lineup of the group Tangerine Dream. Peter Ballman, Chris Frank, and the late great Edgar Froze. And the reason why I include them all three in this my next spot is because. The work they did as one still remains phenomenal to this very day. Atom, Rubicon, Phaedra, Zeet, the soundtrack, some of the soundtracks they did, um, the soundtrack for the movie Sorcerer from 77, phenomenal group that did. Actually, phenomenal work that these guys did back in the early 70s. Okay. Okay. Next mm-hmm. guy I got spent a little time with Jeff Beck, which, by the way, did you see that video I sent you there, Earl? Yes, I did, yeah. Well, was I right about that bass player? Yes, you were, absolutely, man. She is. Uh, she was a damn good bass player. Yeah, she could keep up with Beck. Anybody can keep up with Beck's got to be decent. Absolutely. Anyway, yeah. Jan Hammer. Mm, oh, yeah. The guy who also did the, uh, he did two albums with Journey's Neil Sean. And with um, he also did the theme for Miami Vice. Yeah. He also uh, did a couple other p- uh, p- instrumentals that uh, were played on the soft rock station around that time. There, in fact, he released an album called Escape from Television. You know, kind of to get away from that stigma there. All right. Okay. Circle, scratch. Minoff. All right. Did you say Rock Monanoff? What? I think he meant Rock Monanoff. Uh, I don't think I heard of that person there. Oh, Classic closer. Oh, who? I said Art. You're breaking up. Okay. Well, your your voice is your voice is breaking up as well. 
Oh. What's the name you said, Rachmaninoff? Yeah, Sergio. Uh, Sergio. Sergio, I see there. Yeah. Keith, you got to get close to your mic, dude, man. That was a guy from the early days. I mean, uh, Sergio really Mendes. Early days. I mean, I'm talking really early days. He's a classical okay. pianist. I see. My bad there. The. Okay there. I guess it's your turn there. Oh, I thought it would be yours, but I'll go. Yeah, because uh, no, no, you're right. It is mine. My bad. Duh. Okay, now this gal deserves a lot of credit because she did a lot of composing with her uh, ex-lover. There, they were both members of the Revolution, Prince's old '80s backup band. Uh, she was first joined uh, Prince back in uh, early 1980 when they um, for the Dirty Mind album there. And uh, she was long, um, her and her gal pal, Wendy Melvoin, the guitar player, were members of the revolution up until about their, uh, they were let go in, in the early uh, 1987 there. They embarked on a, a career of their own, released a couple albums of their own. They also did a soundtrack for the Showtime series Soul Food, and it contributed to the Orange is the New Black music as well there, from what I understand. I'm talking about... Lisa Coleman from Prince and the Revolution. Okay. Mm hmm. My next one was a fairly large part of a mid late 60s band, actually. Uh, a guy by the name of Ray Manzarek. Oh, yeah. The Doors. He passed away in 2013 there. Yeah, he. He was a part of all the Doors albums. He, he was, yeah. Solo, he had some solo work of his own. In fact, uh, he's after Jim Morrison's death, the Doors did two albums without him, Other Voices and Wolf, Wolf Circle. And if I understand, his voice is similar to Jim's. Uh, is it my turn? Sure. Your turn. Arthur Rubenstein. Am I, am I sounding better right now? Yes. We heard okay. that name loud and clear. Yeah, that's right. another classical pianist. All right. All right there. So uh, Keith is going deep, definitely for sure, man. Which Ready is cool. to you. All right. The next one on my list is someone that I mentioned the YR earlier on. Um, John McElgier, he released albums like Oxygen, Exodus, and of course that performance I was talking about earlier at the program about this concert in Houston, Texas – in 1986, it was the uh, it was um, it was in respect to the uh, crew of the Challenger who died in that uh, flight earlier that year. You're talking to John Michael Jarre. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Look up the album. He, uh, I guess it's called Houston something. There, forgot the title, but but it was a live album recorded from that particular performance. Whole city of Houston, Texas, was transformed into a um, concert stage. Why stand there? I even said it in, sent the link to the Wikipedia article in the chat here. Definitely worth checking out. Yeah, oxygen is great. Ah, uh, yeah, I heard. A, I remember hearing tracks from that as well. Okay. So he definitely works. Deserves a lot of credit. My next guy had his own group in the '60s. He was the main guy. Well. I say he was the main guy. He was the leader, but the main guy was another guy by the name of Mark Lindsay, and this is Paul Revere. All right. All right. I see there. All right. Definitely worth uh -huh. a mention there. Yeah. Franz Lizzik. Franz Lizzik. Yeah, Franz Litz. Franz Litz? Yeah. And what band is he? Another classical composer? Classical performer. I see there. Ah, all right. The next one on my list is another member of the Revolution, Prince's band. He was the doctor of the group. He wore that surgical outfit all the time, shades. Matt Fink was his name. And he, uh, him and the Revolution still do, do shows together. It's just simply, of course, a Revolution without Prince, obviously, there. 
they do that a couple a couple of times in the Minneapolis area there, but unfortunately Prince is no longer around to confront that group. Okay, my next one was the keyboardist and main vocalist of the Dave Clark Five, Mike Smith. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, and uh, all right. Somebody had a phone I, just called. Oh, actually, actually, it's another vacation. Ken and Drew are going to do their show in a while there. I guess about 30 minutes if I'm correct. Okay. All right, Murray, Terrence. Murray, Who? Oh, yeah. Who? Who? Wait, let him say it. Say it again. Me? Yeah. Yeah. Murray Prahila. Okay, Another that guy I'm not familiar post. with. I don't. I don't think I've heard of him either. You say Virgin Highland? Hiya. <laughs> Murray Pahila. Murray Pahila. What are the details, if any? Oh, uh, let me see. Um, Murray Pahila, Pahila may have started playing the piano when he was just four, but it wasn't until the age of fifteen that he says he. And then I have to click the website. All right, there. Do you want All me right. to the website? Yeah. Okay. All right, look it up, and I'll um, definitely uh, give my, my the last two here. Oh, God. What I about... got about 20 more. All right, there. So I have to, um, if you want to continue with this, uh, you can go ahead, dude. Yeah, so I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll probably definitely have to find uh, more keyboardists to talk about there. Now, this one was part, was a member of the time. With the bands that Prince, you know, supposedly I discovered, they had hit songs like Cool, 779, what is it called there? 779311. Yeah, that was a big hit on the funk radio station there. Uh, what Time Is It was their main, was one of their main albums. Albums like Girl, songs like Girl, you know, um, the ones I just mentioned, The Walk, Ice Cream Castle, The Bird. This meant well. That this guy wasn't on, on that album when uh, that that song was released. There, him and the, and the bass player were let go from the group because apparently they missed the show. There, they was replaced by somebody else with two other people. There, well, one of the guys they replaced was uh, fuck it. I'm getting out of control here, but Jimmy Jam Harris from the time, who would later go on with Terry Lewis, the bass player, to produce. Alexander O'Neill, Morris Day, Janet Jackson, You Edition, hmm. The Human League, you name it. They were all over the place and around the uh, 80s there. All right. Okay, my next. I, you want me to read about Murray Pahila? Yeah, go ahead. Pahila may have started playing the piano when he was just or, but it wasn't until the age of 15 that he says he became seriously interested in music in 1972. He became the first lead North American to win the Leeds Piano Competition. Following the year, he worked with Benjamin Brand and Peter Pierce at the Alde uh, Festival in 1992. A bone of Marvel House is in a small voice. Then to take some time off performing. It was during this time that he found solo in the music of J.C. Botch. His Botch recording is regarded as some of the best ever made man that was so boring to read i'm glad i'm done reading it that was one of the most boring paragraphs i ever read in my time okay i have you had to hear the guy myself there all right okay next one i got perhaps you've heard of mm -hmm. used to play for santana and then journey greg raleigh ah that's right there is he still involved in music these days or did he uh oh that i don't retire know. all right there and um my last one for this list was also a member, is also still a member of the time. Uh, he was the only white guy in the group, Mr. Monte Moyer. Because uh, he did some production work as well, including that song from Alexander O'Neill, If You Were Here Tonight. He produced that song, and that song still played on the radio today on various soft rock stations and RB stations. Okay. My All next right. one is Jordan Rudess. Mm -hmm. Dream Theater and a solo career. I see there, yeah. 
All right. And uh, it, let's see. Glenn Gold. Who? Glenn who? Glenn Gold. G G O U L D. Good. I see. Good. Good. Glenn Gould. Okay, there. And it's my my stream is like lagging like fucking hell, man. I don't know why it's doing this. I got to If there was a person I could contact to help and run the OBS, you know, fix things up there, I wish appreciate it, man. But this thing is pissing me off. Do you have anybody left there, doctor? I don't know. I said the only like person I, I was able to. The only person I was able I'm to talk to, key, to was keyboard. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I know someone that could help you. Should I message her? Yes, person. Yeah. Nick, it's, if it's Dave Rose, forget it. Uh, he's okay. not, He's on bad terms with everyone right now. Okay. Well, he's, I guess he's okay with me because I don't know what's going on. All right. You have to talk to YR about it there when you get the chance before we go uh, next time we go live or afterwards. Okay. All right, okay. Dave. You want me I to get, read through my list or do you have other people? No, I don't have no more people. I'm uh, done for uh, for the that's all the, that's the end of my list. Okay, let me go through mine real quick, and you guys can go. Okay. Oh yeah, him. Mm -hmm. Dennis DeYoung. All right. Alan Price. Oh uh, yeah, from the animals. Gary Wright. Oh yeah, the Dreamweaver. We know his song. That and uh, Love Is Right. Love Is Alive. Right. All right. Okay. And Pigpen from uh, Ron Pigpen, I can't pronounce his last name, from the Grateful right. Dead. Uh, all right. Must be sir. Mark Stein, Vanilla Fudge. Mm -hmm. All right. Felix Caballero. Mark Stein. Um, but yeah, listen, we got to wrap it up here soon because Ken's going on. I'm working on it. Thank you. All right, there. All right. Felix Caballero from the Young Rascals. All right, there. Edgar Winter. Oh, yeah. Johnny's son. Patrick I mean, Mor Johnny's brother. My bad. Uh -huh. Yeah. Patrick Moraz. Oh, yeah. From the Moody Blues as well. And a one-time member of Yes. Ken Hensley. From Uriah Heep. And also one time briefly a member of Blackfoot. Yeah. Doug Engel. All right. Uh, Iron Butterfly. All right. Well, I can't read that name, so we'll skip him. Okay. Steve Walsh. Mm -hmm. From Kansas, the band. Dr. John. Oh, yeah, another uh, Cajun musician there, if I understand. Yeah, he had, a, he had a pretty good career, too. All right. Christine McVie. From Fleetwood Mac, ex-wife of John McVie. Herbie Hancock. Oh, yeah, we know his work. He had uh, composed for the soundtrack for the first Death Wish movie in the 70s there with Charles Bronson. Also known for that breakdancing hit, Rocket. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised Keith didn't find him. Yeah. I have a very long list. All right. I'll name two more, and then I'll let you do what you need to do. Okay. Uh, Bill Powell of Leonard uh, Skinner. Yeah, rest in peace. And Chick Corea. Uh, the jazz, I knew it was going to get to that name because I'm ever hearing about him a few times there. And Keith, you got anybody you want to? Yeah, uh, so best of love, Richard. Richard. All right. Best of love, Richard. All right. Uh, um, okay. All right. No, I don't think I've heard of him. Lang Lang. 